Good afternoon. I'm going to begin by telling you a true story that happened to me a few years ago. The story is set in South Africa, in Cape Town, about 10, 15 kilometres east around Stellenbosch. And it's the last day of a wonderful week of flying vintage aircraft. On the day in question, I was actually the pilot in command of a Tiger Moth. Now, the Tiger Moth is one of those romantic aircraft. You've probably seen it in Out of Africa or the English Patient. It's a very basic 1930s biplane. It has an open cockpit. The pilot sits in the rear. The passenger sits in the front. And this is a plane that is devoid of technology. This is an analogue aircraft. Uh, to give you an idea, the most complicated thing is the cockpit. Um, and the grey thing in the middle is the compass. It's a bit like a ship's compass. You have to look down on it. This is an aircraft that really you have to fly. To give you an idea of how basic it is, this is the airspeed indicator. It's on the wing, <laughs> right? And it is simply a gauge which, as you go faster or the wind blows faster, it tells you how fast you're going. <laughs> very, very basic flying. Um, this is an aircraft with no brakes, no tailwheel. It's just a skid at the back that helps you stop with friction. So this is something that you really have to fly. Now, when you are flying it, it is fantastic. It's an amazing experience. And on this particular day, these pictures are taken from the day, you can see there was a wonderful sunny day and there was a little bit of cloud and we were flying sort of up and below the cloud. And I, with my friend Chris, who's in the front, we were doing a sort of six, seven hour trip. And one of the things we decided to do was to do some practice landings, what they call touch and goes. And we picked out a small strip in the middle of a big forest. And I set the aircraft perfectly into the glide, touched the wheels down exactly as I hoped to do on the very edge of the runway. This is not a long runway. This is like 450 metres long. And this is an aircraft that needs 350 metres to take off. And we're doing about 60 kilometres an hour. So there's not a lot of time for something to go wrong. And as I put the power on, the engine coughs once, twice and dies. We quite literally, or I quite literally, have a second, maybe no more, to work out what I'm going to do. It's evident I cannot take off. I will not make it over the trees. They're about 60 foot high. So I know I'm going to have to crash. No choice. And at that point, I wasn't afraid. That comes about 30 seconds later. All right? But at that point, I wasn't afraid because there was a lot I had to do. I had to check that had I put everything on, was everything OK? And everything, all the information that I had, told me that the things were fine. It was clearly something more severe. And so I came up on the intercom and said, mayday, engine failure. Now, Chris, up the front, also an experienced pilot, and it was also his aircraft, uh, <laughs> he decided that he would take control. Right? So he came back and said, I have control. And at that point, I quite literally placed my life in his hands. My hands come off the stick, off the throttle. I tighten my straps. My hands go across my chest. And I won't admit, at that's the point, that's when the fear starts to hit. That's when the adrenaline starts to pump. Right? I am now in somebody else's hands in an aircraft going 60 kilometers an hour, and I know we're going to crash. And Chris, what Chris had seen was actually, if he went across the field, it gave him just a little bit longer for him to go across, taking the angle. For the mathematicians, that's Pythagoras in action, going across the hypotenuse. So as we rumble our way across the ground, he says the next three words. And these are three words I hope that none of you have to hear in your life. Brace, brace, brace. At this point, you go from being slightly afraid to actually complete panic, right? <laughs> this is the realisation that in about a second or so, you're either going to be up in the clouds or you're going to be hurt, or if you're lucky, you might be alive. Now, evidently, I'm here, so there's a story with a happy ending. But at that point, the world goes into slow motion. My world suddenly, literally turns upside down and it goes dark. And what's happened is, unbeknown to us, there were some little trees that had ripped the undercarriage off the, air off the aircraft. The uh, aircraft had gone nose first into uh, the ground, snapped the propeller, catapulted us through a complete somersault, broken both wings, and smashed us into the foot of the trees. Uh, at this point, we're at an angle, and I can smell fuel dripping onto a hot engine. This is an aircraft made of wood and canvas. That is not a good thing to happen. Um, now, we were alive, slightly shaken but not stirred, as they say in England, and uh, we were able to climb out and put the aircraft back on the ground. And in fact, that was about 
two minutes before, and that is about two minutes after. Um, and we pulled it back down, and it's a very sad sight. But we were alive. Now, why were we alive? Hang on to that thought. And now the next question you've probably got in your mind is, great story, but what on earth has this got to do with digital transformation? OK, I'm going to try and explain. So I believe that when you are uh, an organisation, it doesn't matter whether it's a public organisation or a university or a company, going through digital transformation, you need to understand the context. Digital transformation is one of those words, or digitisation, it's the same thing, that many people misunderstand or have different views of. I don't think the definition matters. We just need to understand that it is an organisation's reaction to massive disruption. It's disruption caused typically by technology. And when technology does three things, when there's new emerging technology and lots of it, when that technology is cheap, right, and when you can put it together. And it's that combination, this is why there are so many startups, that combination of uh, availability, price affordability, and the ability to mix it that creates the sort of scale of rapid disruption that we get in organizations. And of course, change is frightening. You think as an organization, you're being asked to change the wings of an aircraft in flight. It seems almost impossible, right? You want proof, you want facts. Of course, the, the nightmare is it's the technology that's caused the issue. And what do most people think the answer is? The technology that they don't understand, right? So it starts to become quite a difficult problem. And of course, what we're forgetting, and when most people talk about digital transformation, they talk about technology, what we're forgetting is it's all about people. And it's about people and how people use the technology to overcome those problems. So as we start to look at digital transformation, we need to look at it in the human context, not just in the technology context. We need to understand that actually, if you don't, if you fear, if there is anxiety, and there will be, if there is resistance, that's normally because they don't trust you as an individual. Imagine you're now the architect or the engineer who has to change those wings, all right? Why should I trust you? What experience have you got of that? How do I know that what you're going to do is going to be safe? Or they don't trust the process. We haven't got enough facts or information uh, for us to be able to make this decision now. All right? I'll do that next quarter, but I've got to deliver this quarter's targets. Right? Sound familiar? Or it's maybe in the destination. Yeah, I'm not con con convinced that's the right sort of aircraft we want to have, and those will be the right wings. Come back and prove to me, you know, and you start to get this resistance. Now, some of it is understandable, but it's there, and it acts as a handbrake on the pace of change. So if we are able to focus on this idea of actually really overcoming those fears, really focus, if you like, on the human component, on trust, and building trust, but not doing that in isolation. What we want to do is to have trust with technology. The two must go hand in hand, because the digital transformation is about how you then scale and make that technology work for you. Right? And therefore, we need to include the human component in it. So this idea of trust is, when used properly, starts to be an accelerator. And if you've got that resistance, that human sort of normal behavior, it starts to be a handbrake. So what we need to look at then is what are the two or three things that exist in a digital transformation context around trust? Well, the first of those is agile leadership. And agile leadership is the ability for leaders, and that can be a professor in a university, it can be a politician in a government, it can be a chief executive or somebody in a company. But for those leaders to be able to understand that actually some of their skills are no longer relevant, and that new skills are going to come in, and that new expertise is required, and that they still have a job to do about setting direction and clarity, but they also then have to step back. They have to serve to lead. They have to get in and help the organization by mentoring, by coaching, by supporting, but also by allowing the people with the relevant skills to really step forward and take accountability. And that idea of sort of agile leadership, that's tough to do. And then you need information. And of course, we're overwhelmed with information at the moment. There's big data, there's this data, there's dirty data, there's clean data. How do we know what data's right? Well, that's where things like analytics come into it and data scientists. You need a way to path through that 
capability to understand the information to make it relevant but you have to understand too you're never going to have perfect clean data you've got to go with incomplete data and be able to make decisions when you combine that with agile leadership you can test learn optimize you can improve you don't have to have everything perfect to start with but of course you can't do any of that unless you're able to communicate this effectively and the communication part is partly about simplicity and clarity of the message but it's also about how you collaborate together. It's about how all these things combine. When you've got these people with new skills and they've got the right information, are they able to actually work together on solving a particular need? Or are you going to force them to operate in silos and incentivize them to carry on in this vertical sort of analog world? So when those three things exist together in harmony, you get acceleration, you get trust. When one of those things doesn't exist, things start to slow down. So, what does all of that have to do with flying a tiger moth in South Africa? Well, as an organisation, irrespective of the type of organisation, too often we are the happy pilot sitting in the aircraft, tootling along quite happily, the sun is shining, and we're not looking outside the cockpit. Right? And then something happens, something completely unplanned, on a scale that's unprecedented, and you're suddenly in reaction mode. And you need to make sure that you are flying the aircraft, that the aircraft is not flying you. When we had our engine failure, all right, the reason that we survived, some of you will say, yeah, well, you were lucky. Well, I think you make your own luck. I think the company that you join, or the degree to which you get involved, or the way in which you ask for help, or the way in which you shape your own future, the way in which you train for things, the way in which you lead, all of these things impact how you're able to respond in a situation which is uncertain. And we live in a world in which everything at the moment is uncertain and changing. So what we need to do is find a way that we can bring this into our daily lives in digital transformation. In our case, we had three things going for us. We had agile leadership. Legally, I was the pilot in command. Legally, if something had gone wrong, had we crashed and had a death, I would be the one that would be to blame. But I was comfortable in handing over control to Chris because actually Chris's expertise in this particular area was different from mine, was better, was more appropriate to the task. We had information. I had my head in the cockpit looking at the dials. Was the, was the fuel gauge down? Was there something else happening? Right? Chris was up the front looking around outside, and he could see that by going across the ground, we had more time, and that might mean that we could take some speed off, and that might mean the difference between serious injury and life. And we had really good communication. We knew what we had to do. And when I said and ceded control and said, you know, we have an engine failure, only nine words passed between us, between declaring the emergency and us sitting beside the aircraft relieved. Mayday, engine failure. I have control. Brace, brace, brace. And at each stage, as we said those words, different actions happened. We knew what our roles were. We were collaborating. We were communicating clearly. And so I think the reason that we exist we got through that crisis was because actually, fundamentally, we had trust. Now, the bit that we didn't have was a huge amount of technology. Right? Um, and I'm not sure that whether we'd had GPS or whether we'd had anything else would have made any difference. I don't think having brakes would have made much of a difference because actually the speed we were going and the efficiency of those brakes and all aircraft would probably have meant that we would have still crashed at the end of the runway. So sometimes it isn't about just having technology, it's about having and using the technology in the right way to solve the needs and the issues that you're dealing with. And how you do that is very much focused on making sure that you think about the human element working with technology. It is about making sure that you have trust with technology. Independently, they're powerful, but together they make a huge difference. Thank you very much.